Good afternoon. Welcome. So glad to have you here. Um, I'm Jane Dutton and I am uh, one of the people who works at the center, who's proud of the center and who's helped to put together this series um, for Positive Links that's based on this book, How to Be a Positive Leader. Um, it's the end of this series, so it's a time to say thanks um, before we introduce our speakers. And I want to um, thank the Joneses again, Paul and Diane Jones, who are sitting up here in the front in the honored seat, very well deserved because they've been supporting Positive Links since, almost since it started, and we greatly appreciate your support. So join me in a round of applause. <laughs> Um, I also have uh, three wonderful women to thank who, um, you know when you're putting on anything like this, there's always people sort of who are slightly invisible but hugely visible to the person who's standing in the front or, or the person sort of clicking on and watching a Positive Links video because they really have made a huge difference in uh, the quality of Positive Links this year and the smoothness. So first is Angie Seely, who's right behind here. Who <laughs> who plays a major role in the center uh, organizing our events. Um, and Janelle Fry, where is Janelle? Yes. And Janelle is the relational manager who uh, manages kind of when we have speakers come and uh, makes their schedules work beautifully and seamlessly. Really grateful for all the work that you do. And then uh, Jennifer Evans, who's sitting over here in the corner, who uh, doesn't have a formal role. But she's one of those people who shows up and chips in and helps out in amazing ways, not just in this event, but in many events for the center. So we're really grateful to you. And I, I have a little goodie for you. I forgot to do that. So maybe you can come here and pick. It has your name on it. A little goodie. Just a small little thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, um, I also... I have my bell here. Usually we do a high quality connect, connecting um, exercise, but because we have um, speakers who I want to make sure I give you lots of time with, I'm going to assume that you're doing virtual high quality connections in your mind. Okay, so when you turn and you face anybody, beam them and collect, you know, create a virtual high quality connection. Um, because I want to use this time again because it's kind of the finale as a time to sort of thank the center. Uh, personally, and uh, I wanted to thank the center for being such a, an amazing source of inspiration, energy, and hope about ways of leading and designing organizations that bring out the best in people and in institutions. And I don't know if any of you saw the David Brooks column in the New York Times yesterday, but it's one of those uh, columns that I got from about five or six people um, on both Facebook and Gmail, so I knew it was an article I needed to read. Um, but he, had, he said something that really makes me think of the center and its possibilities and all of the people in this room at Ross and beyond who yearn to make work organizations better institutions that foster human flourishing. And the center is not a place. It's actually a community of people. And the Brooks, our David Brooks article opened with the idea, and I quote, when you meet certain people or find certain communities, they radiate an inner light. They listen well. They make you feel funny and valued. You often catch them looking after other people. And as they do, their laugh is musical and their man manner is infused with gratitude. They are not thinking about what wonderful work they are doing. They are not thinking about themselves at all. And it's in this spirit that we gather in Positive Links, in, in the Positive Business Conference, in our classes, and in the PLUS Lab, and around the table today and in future days, to raise each other up to the grounded possibilities that we can do better by fostering organizations that are truly effective and life-giving at the same time. That's my tribute and thanks to the center. So in that, in that spirit, let me introduce um, our two wonderful colleagues and speakers today. My amazing colleague, and our Associate Dean, Lynn Wooten, and a PhD from Michigan Organizational Psych Program and current Dean of the Guizetta Business School at Emory University, uh, Erica James. I'm going to give you just a bit about each of them. Lynn is one of our own. After getting her MBA at Duke, she came to Ross, at, to Michigan, and got her PhD, 
PhD and joined the M&O and Strategy faculty. She's been a highly prolific scholar and a top-rated teacher, working broadly in the domain of human resource management and strategy. Um, I can't tell you the difference that she's made as associate dean of our undergraduate program. Um, our undergraduate program is always rated very highly, but sort of underneath the rating you always thought, hmm, it could be better. Well, she is leading the effort to make the undergrad program spectacular. And it's been uh, an amazing thing to, as a member of the faculty to watch her in action as a, as a highly effective uh, change leader. Now, Erica is also one of our own. Uh, she received her PhD, as I already mentioned, in organizational psych. And I even got to do research with her and Sue Ashford when we were grad students. We have a publication together, yes. Uh, and Erica has served on the faculty of Tulane, Emory, and Darden. And at Darden, she's, she led lots of different things very effectively, but I was a, uh, particularly excited about her work in creating a highly successful women's leadership program. Um, and she's become a subject expert on work, both workforce diversity and crisis leadership. In 2010, Erica and Lynn um, published a, a very important book called Leading Under Pressure, From Surviving to Thriving, Before, During, and After a Crisis. They've written a lot of academic articles on this as well. Oh, I, in fact, I would call them some of the real deep subject experts on this topic. And we're so, we were so lucky to get them in their busy lives to write a chapter for this book, and we're especially lucky to have them be uh, the finale in the, in the Positive Link series. So uh, with that introduction, let me welcome both of you, and uh, thanks for coming. No one can do introductions like Jane, so Jane, thank you for that wonderful introduction. And um, it's always, I guess I never left the nest in some ways, so it's good to be back in the nest, but it's especially good when you have your sister and best friend presenting with you. <laughs> So today, um, as Erica, she doesn't like me to say how long we've been doing crisis research, but we've been doing it as long as my son, who's been alive, was a sophomore in college. <laughs> so today I'm going to share um, a long, extensive research about really how do organizations and leaders and groups create opportunities from crisis. So our roadmap is we're going to do an introduction kind of conversation starter. We'll introduce kind of our conceptual framework. Then we, uh, you didn't have a chance to do the formal high quality connection that Jane likes to do, but we're going to let you talk in your table for a couple minutes about typical crisis leadership behavior. Then we're going to explore crisis leadership from the model that Erica and I developed that's really grounded in positive organizational scholarship. And in particular, we're going to focus on a couple dimensions such as quick and ethical decision making, really how do you build trust and gain the respect of stakeholders, the importance of organizational learning during a crisis, and then seeing a crisis as an opportunity, and then some concluding discussion. Our approach today will be based on theory, but cases, some personal experiences, and we hope that you have the chance to really have dialogue, deep reflection, and leave here with a different approach the next time you see a crisis. So if you think about life in organizations, and I've spent all my life in the business school, no one really tells you how to deal with these situations. I mean, every day now I come in my office, there's something ambiguous, there's time pressures, there's organizational change going on, sometimes there's something that happens by surprise, there are external threats, there's shocks to the system. But very seldom in any class, whether it be in a business school class or a law class, are you really prepared for this? But if you think about it, many things that we do, including this dysfunctional behavior we see in organizations, really calls for extraordinary crisis leadership. Yet, when a national survey looked at organizations and they asked them, are you ready for your next crisis? 79% of decision makers said, no, we're not ready for crisis. We hit our organization today. Only 54% say they have a plan, and we all know sometimes plans is just, you know, a paper stuck in a file cabinet, because even those said that 47% of their plans have gaps in them. Yet, if you think about crisis, almost every crisis in itself really contains these seeds of success. You know, most of the times we think of crisis as a route to failure, but if we take a step back as leaders in organizations and think about how we can learn from a crisis, how we can find the best, 
how we can cultivate and harvest success, organizations actually come out better after a crisis. Or I like Bill George's quotes, in a crisis we learn who the real leaders are. And so that's the tone we want to set today as we get you to think about crisis leadership from a positive organizational scholarship perspective. So as your conversation starter, you have a deck of cards, and I know that we have to switch them from this table here. And so unclip your cards at your tables. And what we want you to do is spend about five minutes with your table mates, introduce yourself, and discuss how these cards represent someone in the news or someone you know reacts to a crisis situation. And then on your conversation, start to think about what you learn. And the deck of cards are pretty diverse. In fact, you know, my favorite one in the deck is the one that says, see no evil, hear no evil. But there's denial, there's depression, there's panic. So pick a card and take about five minutes to discuss it with your table mates. So what did you talk about at your tables? How do people manage crisis, the typical behavior that we observe? Really, who said really negative? Okay, example? <laughs> it's not very positive. Any other observations or discussions that occurred at your table other than negative? Right, so this domino effect of the negative behavior occurs. Many of these acts, they complement each other and feed off of each other. Other observations? Um, a lot of ours were like emotional-based, and we started trying to no one fixes damage control, and then we talked about any experience where someone actually felt like they had control or plan. Right, so there's the emotional side, and many times people feel that they have lack of control. Great point. You had a comment? Well, uh, some of these things you come natural like anxiety it's, it's it's kind of an emotional response to a new unknown situation right. that you have to deal with but usually that you, know, you eventually get over it and start working on it rather than feel paralysis and also um, it's uh, some some things like damage control could have a positive spin on it right if, if it's not it's not about don't blame me but let me explain why this happens and what we are going to do about it Right. So, yeah, we, yeah we're t we'll talk about how you use that to build trust. And so those are all examples of behaviors we observe. Um, if you think about them, you, you've called it out here. There's psychological and behavior responses. Fear, denial, panic, paralysis, damage control. And the question becomes, in organizational life, when you see those type of behaviors, though, what are the consequences? If you're operating out of fear and denial and panic and it, Anxiety, what are the consequences when you need to manage this difficult situation? Usually it usually gets worse. It gets worse, right. And, you're, and you want it to get better. Yeah. yeah. Other consequences you think? Um, a loss of trust from a variety of stakeholders. Right, you lose trust from your stakeholders and that has short-term and long-term consequences. Other things, back there, Virginia. Right, sometimes you don't address the issues, they just stay buried because you're stuck in these behavior responses. Lack of engagement and people jump ship. They jump ship, engagement, they disconnect. The, you know, the, the organization is not handling the crisis, let me get off the boat. And so the ability, back there. Say that again. Yeah, it, it, and it, that occurs. And so you have these negative behaviors and people are just like perplexed and don't realize it. So some of the work when Erica and I first started is actually our own Jane Dutton, that she did early on, about this threat rigidity. And if you think about difficult situations, um, basically the threat exists and individuals and groups and or organizations they develop some reaction to it. And they become very rigid about how they think about the reaction. And those reactions, sometimes they can be constrained responses. Maybe they start controlling behavior. Or maybe they start this really conserving resources. And so one of the things we wanted to do is we wanted to go beyond that to say, okay, if you think about what we've learned in positive organizational scholarship,
leadership then, you know, how do you go beyond this threat rigidity or how do you go beyond some of the psychological and behavior responses that we typically see in a crisis situation? So the next thing is we, we want to unveil our model, but before we unveil our model, I want to put you in another reflective situation and then show you a brief video clip. So um, consider, um, considering the typical response to crisis events, all the ones we talked about, such as denial and panic, um, how do you imagine people will respond to the threat of Ebola coming to the United States? And uh, if anybody knows me well, everyone knows I'm a scaredy cat. So I know how I would respond. <laughs> So, <laughs> so we want to show you this video right here of one of the ones that was out on YouTube. On this exact same, on this exact same day, the 31st, minus one month, I was in Atlanta, Georgia last year. You can see right here. Now, a year later, very bad news is coming out of Atlanta. Breaking news today. Personally, if I was in Atlanta, I would get out ASAP. That's See, just that's my me. personal opinion. I'm not telling you what to do, but that's what I would do. And why am I saying this? If you want to know all the details why, watch this video right here I put up 37 minutes ago. Urgent, don't fly Ebola virus to U.S. U.S. is flying Ebola patient from Africa to Atlanta in a plane, at least one, maybe two patients, to a hospital in Atlanta. So that's why I would get out of Atlanta. I'm telling you right now, you won't see me anywhere near that city anytime soon. This is a huge mistake. Why? Because we know that healthcare workers are the ones at highest risk. They're in direct contact work with the patients that have Ebola. There's been a lot of healthcare workers that have gotten the virus this way, this deadly virus that there's no cure for. And so what are they doing? In fact, the patient they're flying over here, that's how they got the virus from being a healthcare worker over in Africa. And now they're going to fly this patient over here, put them in a hospital, and then have um, healthcare workers right here in the United States working with them. So all it takes is one of those workers to get this virus and go out in the public, walking around to a grocery or whatever, and then infect other people, and then it's going to spread like wildfire across the United States just like it's done in Africa. Makes no sense at all. I don't understand this one bit. This is, this is, it doesn't take a genius to figure out this is a big mistake and a stupid risk that should not be taken. This risk does not need to be taken. All they have to do is fly people over to Africa to take care of this person or these people. So does he exemplify everything we think about, what we just talked about? So hearing that video thoughts, typical crisis behavior, scare tactics. Okay. So I'm going to turn it over to Erica now. Can you hear me? Yes. Wonderful. So um, having come from Atlanta, I, I joined Emory. <laughs> I promise you I do not have Ebola. <laughs> uh, I, I joined Emory University in July, July 15th, 2014. And I started, I moved there to be part of the university as dean of the business school. And one thing that I learned right away is as dean, um, my time was no longer my own. And uh, so I could no longer watch my 45 minutes of the Today Show in the morning getting ready for work and, and the 6 o'clock news at night was no longer in my portfolio of activities and then I was fast asleep by the time the 11 o'clock news came on so I was oblivious to sort of what was happening in the community. And I'm driving to work one day and just to visualize Clifton Road is the corridor for em Emory University in Atlanta. So there's the business school, there's the Emory Hospital, there's the medical school, there's the nursing school, there's the School of Public Health, and there's the CDC all along Clifton Road. So I'm driving to work down Clifton Road on August 2nd, and lo and behold, there's all of this traffic. I'm thinking, what is going on here? And what's going on is all of the media have blocked the roads because within minutes, the first Ebola patient is scheduled to arrive at Emory University Hospital, which is right next door to the business school. So I couldn't, I couldn't get through. So it seems a 
fitting case study to explore the, how Emory University responded to the advent of this threat to its community um, and see whether where there is contradiction or where they contrast with how we just saw the gentleman in the first video who's responding to fear. So to do that, we thought we'd share with you the model that Lynn and I have developed over the years in terms of how we think about what it is that takes leaders and organizations from that moment of uh, being fearful and feeling threatened by an event to transitioning to engaging in actual positive leadership behaviors. So very quickly, what you have here is that the gray bar that says crisis management and damage control are typically the emotional responses and activities that leaders engage in or managers engage in when they are feeling threatened. Now, some managers can pivot and recognize that there's a transition that I can choose to make or not make and engage in a different set of behaviors that will help me lead this organization in a more positive and proactive way. And I contend that the way Emory Hospital handled the arrival of the first Ebola patient is representative of some of the behaviors that we have here. So we're going to walk you through some of these, these models. ABC World News with Diane Sawyer. A uh, good evening to you on this Thursday night. We begin with the breaking news about those Americans fighting the deadly Ebola virus. ABC News has learned that the two American missionaries stricken with the disease are being medevaced home. As we come on the air, a hospital at Embry University in Georgia has announced it is making preparations to receive its first patient. ABC has learned the first patient will be transported to Embry University Hospital in Georgia which has prepared a special isolation unit in collaboration with the CDC. And Rich is here now. Tell me more about how hospitals protect their teams. Yeah, this unit at Emory has been working with CDC. The people there have been drilling, have been training on how do you work wearing these kind of suits, giving the care in an isolation room. You wouldn't want to put someone in who didn't have that training because they put themselves at risk. But the community in Atlanta should have no fear about this patient in their hospital. All right, they have really studied this. Okay, Richard Besser, once again on the story tonight. Thank you. Now that medical charter will take at least one victim to Emory University Hospital in Atlanta. Vincente Arenas is there this morning. Vincente, good morning. There we are, flying Ebola to Atlanta. Good morning. Emory University Hospital here has a special ward that is designed to treat patients with deadly communicable diseases, just like those two American missionaries now in a life and death struggle with this deadly Ebola virus. Emory's isolation unit is on the ground floor, but physically separated from other wards. An Ebola patient will arrive here within the next few days. The hospital declined to reveal that person's identity, but on Thursday, the White House said government officials were working to get two Americans with Ebola out of Liberia. Emory's three-bed isolation center has a highly trained staff and special equipment to keep these pathogens from getting out. There are only four centers like this in the entire country. So what did you hear in that clip that gives you some indication that this was going to be managed in a way that might lead to a positive outcome? Yes. They were, so preparation, training, the work that they had done in advance of this would indicate that they might, things might go okay. Right? Anything else that you heard? Yes. Yeah. So let me start by sharing one aspect of our model, and that is this notion of quick and ethical decision making. Um, I'll return to the, to the notion of mission and values in just a moment, but just to give you a prelude, really the guiding principle for how Emory Hospital reacted and responded to the situation was really embedded in the notion of its core principles. Um, beyond that, there was this notion of being okay with the uncomfortable. So if you recall the cards that you uh, used at your table, so many of them are around this notion of fear and fear driving our outcomes and our decisions. And Emory decided early on, not only are we not going to engage this issue in a manner of fear, we're going to be pretty proactive about it and we are actually inviting this situation into our community. Many other organizations had the choice to say we're going to do this or not. And as you heard from the very first video, so much of what was surrounding this was this notion of fear. I'm going to leave Atlanta and I advise no one to come anywhere near the city um, because of this virus. Well, Emory said we have a responsibility 
and we have the capability to deal with this and we're going to make ourselves uncomfortable uh, in order to do what we know is, is right. So they were being divided by a moral compass. And then this notion of sense making, also a term that um, is largely affiliated with some colleagues here at Michigan, about understanding the nature of the situation, making sense of all of the different dynamics at play, and then operating from a plan that allows you to really use your strengths uh, in order to, to move forward. So going back to this notion of mission and values, I, I think it's important for you to understand the context that the hospital was operating in. The, the core purpose of Emory Hospital stated as um, to serve humanity by improving health through the integration of education, discovery, and health care. And it operates from three core, three core values. One is this notion of excellence. We will be excellent at everything that we strive to do, including those things that we find most difficult or challenging, like solving um, the, the issues around Ebola. Uh, we will operate from a caring place. We are here to serve humanity and to care for our fellow human beings. And then we operate from a place of integrity. So everything that we do is about uh, being driven from ethics and integrity and a set of values to make sure that we can do things in an excellent manner and that we can care for the people who are important to us. So another aspect of ethical and quick decision making is, as you've already alluded to, this notion of preparation. Emory University health care system has been planning for this moment that happened for them on August 2nd, 2014, for 12 years. The design of this hospital room, this, this um, area where folks with communicable diseases and infectious diseases would come, has been in the works with, in collaboration with the CDC for 12 years, not knowing if they would ever have a need to use this. But they recognize this is who we are as a hospital, this is what we must prepare for in case something like this requires our ability to serve in this manner. And so this notion of preparation um, is critical here. And then lastly, this notion about ethical leadership. And we use this notion that, that for Emory University Healthcare System, leadership acts as a, vo it is a vocation for them. And it, I'd like to read this quote verbatim. When Emory received a call, we also knew there was only one way to respond. We knew it was our ethical and moral responsibility to open our doors to receive the missionary aid workers and to provide the care we provide for all who come through our doors. We responded not because it would bring notoriety or fame, but because it was our calling as a healthcare institution. And in fact, this was pretty risky for them to do because there was no guarantee that A, they would be able to, to cure um, the, the initial patient, much less the two others that came after, and they had no way of knowing whether they were going to be able to manage the messaging around this for the community that was ultimately being affected, which was the university, which was the city of Atlanta, it was the media. So this could have gone very badly Right? So it was a risk, but it was a risk they were willing to take because they felt it was so important to operate from their um, moral compass. So another core principle is this notion of engendering trust and the respect of core stakeholders. Again, going back to our Michigan roots, we draw on the work of another Michigan colleague and understanding what are some of the key principles associated with building and, and sustaining trust. And there, there are four that we refer to, reliability, openness, competence and compassion. And in this regard, by every analysis that we've been able to undertake, the Emory Hospital was basically a rock star in how it managed and engaged um, and built trust with the various stakeholders. And I have a depiction up here of some of who those stakeholders are. So in the top left, you see Dr. Brantley. That was the first patient who came into the hospital with Ebola. He was the ultimate stakeholder in some regard because his life was being entrusted to the medical care providers at the hospital and they had to be credible, they had to be competent, they had to be open and transparent about what they were able to do, what they thought was going to happen, how this was going to unfold, uh, and they had to be reliable in the delivery of their care. But Dr. Brantley wasn't the only person at stake here. He had a family and his wife and children were very much concerned about what was going to happen. So the trust had to be built not only with the direct patient, but also with the, the support mechanism that surrounded the, pa the patient, in this case, his family. Uh, the hospital, as someone else has already mentioned, formed a very deep relationship with the CDC. And I failed to mention that Clifton Corridor in Atlanta, 
So all of those university buildings, at the far end of that, next to the School of Public Health, is the CDC. So contextually, they were primed to be able to communicate and work together in a collaborative manner, and the geography facilitated that to happen. And so it wasn't just the hospital that was responsible for building trust and, and, and helping um, cure uh, Dr. Brantley, but it was the CDC and the CDC and the medical staff working together to create a positive relationship. I told you that Emory Hospital is a part of a broader university, and so there were students and faculty and staff who were very much affected um, by the, the bringing Dr. Brantley to, to our community. And so we have a picture here describing them as a set of stakeholders, the broader community of Atlanta, and then the medical workers, both in the bottom right and the bottom center. And then in the very middle is the uh, media who were staked out in front of the hospital for the duration of all of that. And the media are important here, not that they're necessarily a stakeholder, but they are a conduit by which information is transferred to the broader community. And so the hospital's ability to build trust with that media stakeholder group was going to have significant implications on what the messaging was that ultimately got out to the, to the Atlanta and broader communities. Communicate, 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 the number one rule in building trust. And I, I know we have a PR person here, and I, I would imagine you would agree how important that is. Um, and for our, from our perspective, it's not now just the mainstream media. Uh, the, the reporters who are standing outside the building with their big cameras and, and microphones and notepads waiting for something to happen, but it's also what's happening uh, in the social media space. And so much of how sense-making happens is by what people outside of the organization are communicating. And the power that social media has to both um, advantage or disadvantage the organization is really meaningful and the hospital had to pay attention and monitor and be on top of and be proactive in communicating both through the traditional forms of media and also through the, through the social media outlets. And then finally in the trust dimension, I'll, I'll share with you this notion of we had trust evangelists. So there were people who were so committed to what the hospital was doing that they were then telling the story, trying to, to send out the right message. So this is a quote from Susan Mitchell, who was the chief nurse at the Emory Hospital during this. And she said, the fears, meaning the fears of the person in that first video, are unfounded and reflect a lack of knowledge about Ebola and our ability to safely manage and contain it. Emory University Hospital has a unit created specifically for these types of highly infectious patients and our staff is thoroughly trained in infection control procedures and protocols. Beyond that, the public alarm overlooks the foundational mission of the U.S. medical system. The purpose of any hospital is to care for the ill and advance knowledge about human health. At Emory, our education, research, dedication, and focus on quality, essentially everything we do, is in preparation to handle these types of cases. So through this messaging, yeah, I've highlighted some key words that bring out some of the principles of trust. If you talk about safety, if you talk about being trained, that's the competence dimension. If you talk about caring for the ill, that's the compassionate dimension of building trust. And so some people were very much committed to ensuring that um, the right relationship and that trust was fostered with all of the appropriate stakeholders. And then our last principle is this notion of learning, adapting, and reflecting. So this is a quote that we often use in our research to describe organizational learning. Essentially that it is an ongoing, it's a continuous process to make sense of and respond to internal and external change. Right? So organizational learning is more than just the sum of the information held by employees, but it requires an integrative and collective interpretation of new knowledge and involves risk-taking and experimentation. Right? So if we think about that as an activity that organizations have to involve, be involved in in order to learn from and reflect uh, on the situation that they've just experienced. What I like to say is the difference between managing and leading through a crisis is what you do both before, during, and after. And so often when you experience a threat, when you experience something that is challenging or feels risky, our fear is to do what we do on all of those those cards, but we know we have to respond. We have to engage in some action to, to solve the problem or to stop the bleeding. But our focus 
is oftentimes so much on just getting over, like ending it. Let's make it go away. Let's fix it and make it go away so we can get back to business as usual. But the one thing that's important to know is you will never be back to business as usual, right? The world that existed before the threat, before the crisis, doesn't exist anymore after you've solved the problem. And so many of your competitor organizations, if you will, have used the time that you've spent managing this crisis to actually go beyond and, and lead in an upward trajectory, whereas you've been sort of trying to um, dog pedal your way through, through this circumstance, right? So going back to business as usual means that you are going to be behind every other organization because of how you've chosen or needed to spend your time unless you engage in a set of um, reflective and learning behaviors, if you will, right? So what the hospital did was leverage the fact that there was such deep preparation before Dr. Brantley as the first Ebola patient arrived to the hospital. Right? We already, we've, we've established that. But he was one of three patients that ultimately came. After each new Ebola patient arrived to the hospital, there was an after action review, a set of behaviors, a set of practices that were engaged by all the clinical staff and others to understand what worked, what didn't work, what do we need to do differently in advance of this next person, this next patient coming? So that's the way in which they started to engage in, um, in, in learning and reflective and adaptive behaviors. There was ongoing reflection and then there was this notion of creating a community of practice to advance the knowledge that was being gained within the hospital. So there are a number of other organizations connected to the hospital, the Carter Center, um, is a part of Emory University and Jimmy Carter has a vast network um, and is very committed to doing work in Africa and other parts of the region and he has come to the university to learn what we did, what can he learn so that he can use his network of people to deploy some of the same practices when they're doing work in other parts of the region around infectious diseases. There are classes now that exist with students um, at the university talking about what did we learn from the managing the Ebola crisis. There are faculty that are joining forces in collaborative ways across their siloed organizations to, to learn from and move forward in how do we advance ourselves as a school, as an institution, um, based on this very unique circumstance that we have just experienced. So the, the idea of learning, adapting, and reflecting is, is also central. And then finally, and we'll end on this, uh, Lynn and I are strong advocates of the belief that opportunities can be attained. It's clearly the proverbial, you know, when life gives you lemons, you make lemonade, but it's not really clear how that happens. And the work that we've done and part of what we've tried to illustrate today is to show you that engaging in, in some clear activities like building trust and ethical and, and quick decision making um, learning and adapting and reflecting on what you're experiencing, all of those are the ways in which leaders and organizations organize themselves positively and proactively in order to actually reap those, those benefits. So I think it's appropriate that we end on a slide that shows Emory Healthcare and what they're all about, advancing possibilities. And having gone through the idea of um, taking a very threatening situation and leveraging and living their moral compass to advance possibilities has created a world of learning for other hospitals and other systems who will soon find themselves dealing with other new and threatening situations. So I said I was ending there, but I thought it might be most appropriate to end on with one more video. So again, um, Time Magazine named the Ebola clinicians and healthcare providers as the person or people of the year. The top right picture depicts Dr. Brantley, who was the first um, patient to come into the hospital. Scott Gordon has been following Dr. Brantley's recovery from day one. He was the only local reporter in Atlanta for that incredible news conference today. He joins us live again with more news from Dr. Brantley's release. Scott? Well, Meredith, right now, for the first time in nearly three weeks, the isolation wing here at Emory University Hospital is empty. Dr. Brantley is gone. His long medical nightmare finally over. <laughs> Holding his wife's hand, a smile on his face, 
Dr. Brantley marched before the cameras. His message is emotional as it was inspirational. Today is a miraculous day. I'm thrilled to be alive, to be well, and to be reunited with my family. Brantley arrived just 19 days ago, his future uncertain. But when he left, it was truly something to celebrate. Cured with the help of the five doctors and 21 nurses who cared for him. I will not forget you and all that you have done for me. Brantley has come so far since he came down with Ebola in Liberia, and his colleagues described his condition as grave. As I lay in my bed in Liberia for the following nine days, getting sicker and weaker each day, I prayed that God would help me be faithful even in my illness. Doctors now say they're not sure if the experimental drug he received helped, but Brantley says something else helped a lot. I did not know then, but have learned since, that there were thousands, maybe even millions of people around the world praying for me throughout that week, and even still today. A medical missionary who sacrificed so much to help others found himself in need of help and seems forever grateful that he got it. My family and I will now be going away for a period of time to reconnect, decompress, and to continue to recover physically and emotionally. His destination unknown, maybe Texas, maybe Indiana where he grew up, maybe somewhere else, but tonight he's asking everyone to continue praying for all of the Ebola victims still in Africa because for so many of them, there are no miracles. Reporting live in Atlanta, Scott Gordon, NBC5. Scott, thank you. You can just leave it on that image because okay. I think that would be appropriate. Uh, so with that, I, I don't know if we take questions. Yeah, we have about nine minutes to the break. Yeah, happy to answer questions about anything that uh, we shared today. Yes. So let me make sure I understand the question. Um, you're asking how do we leverage the learning from this situation outside of just the medical community or the immediate environment within Emory and Atlanta? Right. Is that? So I know one of the things that the hospital is trying to do is get the messaging out there. There was such important learning coming from this. Uh, and the world has taken notice, and so they, uh, members of the hospital and communication staff and, and some of the clinicians uh, have basically gone on road shows to talk about what they did, how this has worked, what they can help others understand, both about the fear associated with an infectious disease like this, but also about how to respond and how to create a culture uh, that allows people to come together and, and, and work towards eradicating the fear associated with the unknown, but also the, the real logistical aspects of dealing with this particular crisis. So I know that there's been a lot of public attention that they're trying to... So that might apply to fear of violence in the community or police shootings or... Right. What we've found from our research is, one, when you have this crisis situation, you need some type of verbal response. So the communication is really important, as we saw. But then second, that had to be followed with behavior that delivers to resolve the crisis. And I think the Ebola situation at Emory demonstrates both. They communicated, they communicated. And remember how we talked about the negative domino effect? Well, they were the flip side of creating this positive domino effect. Look, yes, Ebola is a contagious disease, but we have protocol. We want to try it. We want to contain it. We're doing the right thing. And, so, and then spreading that organizational learning beyond Emory Healthcare System and the CDC. So when we think about our own leadership journey, it is what do we want to communicate when we're in a crisis situation? How do we want to engage learning beyond our own units and then spread that kind of positive energy? 
the uh, situation after 9-11, uh, Jane and I worked with some companies at this point about greatness could be achieved. Uh, you know, the, the CEO of uh, Reuters uh, who was presented here and said, how can you get his workforce to work that effectively ever again? Right. They were <laughs> yeah. You, it's all adrenaline. Yeah. yeah. Everybody, all hands, I think. I wonder if you can comment on that phenomenon, whether you see that other places where they do handle the situation well, and it's a high point of where the company <laughs> Right, and what we know from the literature is, and so then people go down from that high point, and then what good leaders do is, is that they try to create mini crisis to create this sense of urgency. To really, I mean, that's what Cotter's change thing talks about. How do you create this sense of urgency around even positive events so people become engaged? So not only crisis, but the urgency to seek the next opportunity to build engagement. You showed some statistics early in your presentation. You showed some statistics about uh, how many organizations are not ready for crisis. That's pretty scary because if you look at um, what these people had, they clearly had a community of a collective purpose that then led to the community of practice and excellence and practice that they pursued. So um, this. Uh, 54% uh, had a plan, and of them, 47 had gaps in it. Right. So with that kind of statistic, I look at this and I say, they must have practiced an awful lot and had you know, emergency situations where all details were checked. The fox checking exercise was very clearly done. But not only that, their community a practice were five physicians and 21 nurses right. that were skilled in the art. That's remarkable. Right. For me, that's remarkable that they were that prepared for this. Of course, they had 12 years in the CDC. Office. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but I think you're raising an important point, and one of the things that, that Lynn and I have tried to evangelize in doing this work is how important it is, the preparation is. And it's not that you will ever experience what you plan for, but the exercise of thinking through and planning for something will put you light years ahead of, of not planning for anything. But, but think again then, how does that bring people together with a common spirit, a common focus, and a common, um, a common thread of what they have to do in that particular plan? It gives them a feeling of meaning and purpose mm -hmm. as an employee of a company or as an organization. Absolutely. So other people in this organization are depending upon it. Mm -hmm. Right? That's Does that build that patchwork quilt of people to work together and be collective in both their purpose and their practice? Mm -hmm. I think so. It does. And the other thing we say is if you use that practice to build hope, it erases a lot of fear. So now put your hands together. <laughs> so it is so deeply satisfying to me to see you two up here knocking it out of the ballpark, as they say. And just, you know, the importance of this work. And every time I, you build these powerful examples, I think the principles that you're talking about really come to life both for how we think about our institutions, but also how we think about ourselves um, and how we might deal with crises that are inevitable in our lives. So thank you for your wisdom. And as is customary, where we love artifacts, uh, we need to give you an artifact that reminds you of um, the POS kind of flavor and spirit. So in here you will find um, a beautiful glass artifact with a par positive spiral. Um, and um, you are, this series, only people who have been in the Positive Link series have this artifact. <laughs> so it's very special. Thank you, and we look forward to seeing you next fall, and we welcome you to um, the uh, healthy vegetables and uh, drinks outside. So thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Before you take off, one last thing. We've got the... Uh,
the queen of gratitude here. Yeah. And so we want to actually uh, express some gratitude to you, Jane. First of all, thank you. Guys. <laughs> but Jane, for doing such an amazing job, the way you've talked about the center, the way you've introduced uh, all of our yeah, guests. Thank you. We wanted to give you Thank that. you very much. So thank you. Come back next year. <laughs>